part, um, the talk is going to be about the art market and financialization, but in somewhat non-orthodox understanding of these terms. Um, and the reason I'm saying non-orthodox is because generally within uh, the sphere of contemporary art, when we talk about the art market, we mean a very specific place where economic transactions happen. Uh, we usually tend to also see it as something that's separate, although connected to the rest of the field. Um, and for me, really, like the desire is to actually think of the art market, of the economic dimension of contemporary art, as something that isn't separate, that isn't like an extra zone, but something that is integrated and actually says a lot about the thing that we call contemporary art. Um, to this extent, you know, I don't see the art market as something that, let's say, commodifies the art world, as something that leeches onto it, or just simply underwrites it by providing liquidity, whether in drops or buckets, which might be the case for some, um, but actually as a really kind of fundamental part of what I call the general social institutional complex of contemporary art. And I think, you know, doing, saying all of this in a context of an art fair is really great because within the context of an art fair, we realize that an art fair isn't just about economic exchanges. I mean, more than anything, it is about uh, forming social relations, about making certain relations visible, about forming information, about circulating information, um, about basically making moves within the reputational economy of the field. Um, and all of these uh, uh, kind of dimensions, they say as much about the art market as they say something about uh, the art institutional ecology more generally. Um, so for me, a less kind of delineated framework of economic, social, institutional is what I prefer, something that's much more kind of integrated and seen as an organic single entity. And the reason I think this kind of kind of inlapse is important um, is because it means that we can't actually draw you know crude ethical judgments about that the fact that oh you know artists who function outside of the market system are somehow more ethical than artists who function within it, or uh, that somehow the art market taints the purity of art. Um, so we need to think about things in conjunction, because they don't have to happen separately. That's a very artificial way of uh, seeing, I think, social ecologies more generally. Um, it also means that the characteristics that are attributed to the art market uh, should be read more widely, and they should be read in a sociological manner. And um, that has important consequences, as I hope to show um, as this talk uh, goes forward. And then finally, which is the part that's really interesting to me, because um, I'm kind of interested in this subject from the point of view of policy and potentially of reforming the way that the art market is structured currently. So it means that if really this is, we're talking always about a single ecology, it means that intervention into this ecology can come in various forms. And hopefully through an example that I will give you, a project that I have been involved in, uh, this will become less abstract um, and more concrete. And to quickly turn to the question of financialization and why financialization more general, um, you know, financialization is sort of the buzzword of uh, current kind of economic analyses of what is happening globally. Um, and I guess crudely what financialization entails is that, let's say, the modern industrial economy uh, was based on the premise that um, rise in profits uh, goes hand in hand in reinvestment into capital and reinvestment into equity. Um, this is no longer the kind of main ordering trajectory. So if we, so we shift away from reinvesting into capital into basically extracting value from financial circulation. So in terms of the way that the, con the, the contemporary global economy is structured, it's not in relationship to productive output, but in relationship to financial circulation. Um, and the, the larger research question for me is how does the contemporary art ecology relate to this tendential reorganization within the global economy? And there are a lot of ways, you know, it's a huge question and there are a lot of ways in which it can be answered. And within this talk I will just only kind of give a tiny little sliver of that answer and, um, or of the way that I would like to manipulate 
the kind of financial reorientation of the economy within the context of contemporary art towards a reformation of the art market and the ecology more general. Um, but returning kind of to the classic way in which um, the contemporary art market tends to be described by economists and sociologists of uh, uh, kind of art market studies, most prominent one being Olaf Veltus and Erika Kossler, um, there's sort of three characteristics that I've given to describe the art market. And you know, if we take seriously what I just said, not just the art market, but the entire ecology of contemporary art, um, these three characteristics are lack of transparency at the level of price setting and transaction, which kind of presumes stark informational asymmetries and illiquidity. So what is meant by lack of transparency at the level of price setting? It just basically means, I think the next talk is going to be about this, uh, it's the fact that there are no specific, stable, objective criteria according to which artworks, uh, the prices for artworks are set. So this kind of conundrum has uh, resulted in this kind of misunderstanding of the contemporary art market and the fact that kind of economists just find it absolutely uh, you know, mysterious and idiosyncratic. But actually if you look at some of uh, the characteristics of how pricing works in contemporary art, um, you start seeing a slightly less fuzzy picture. And um, I think a really important um, uh, observation has been made by an economist called Kenise Prindergast, who observed that in the art market, the prices tend to be sticky. Now, sticky prices are prices that have a negative inclination to fall. Um, this ultimately means that the contemporary art market is maybe similar to luxury markets, because sticky prices, that's, that's usually the standard characteristic of luxury markets. But uh, I think that unlike luxury markets where uh, sticky prices are about communicating exclusivity and status and quality, in the contemporary art market, um, sticky prices are much more related to the, to the importance of the reputational economy within this field. So kind of a standard example is that as a gallery, you can't afford literally and metaphorically to have your artists, uh, the pr prices for your artists devalued uh, in time. I mean that would completely undermine your reputation. Um, and, uh, and in a sense the sort of understanding of reputation as a really important mechanism that's really, that's totally related to price setting for me is very crucial because it means that when setting prices for artists, effectively what galleries do is they are plotting a projected hype curve that needs to map onto a kind of price appreciation curves. So they need to understand how the hype around a certain artist, how the information around a certain artist is going to penetrate the institutional and social ecology um, of the contemporary art field and how that in turn can impact the price setting. So I think the fundamental point to take out from this is that um, price setting, it's not even so much about, oh, how do we do it, this is so weird, but it's about where does the actor who can set the price find themselves within the informational terrain of contemporary art. So basically, the more you are an insider of the contemporary art field, the better you are at price setting, because the more information you have, according to which you can basically negotiate uh, or, or decide the price for certain work and uh, for certain practice. Now the, the kind of second level of lack of transparency is at the level of transaction and this just basically means there's no way of tracking or tracing or knowing uh, which works were sold to whom on the primary market, i.e. on the gallery, um, on the gallery circuit. There is some information accessible uh, on the secondary market, but once again, this is just such tiny, uh, it's such a tiny representation of the whole art market that it's hardly, hardly that significant. I guess the only thing that it does signify uh, is the fact that at this sort of really privileged end of the art market, the kind of auction circuit art market, um, there is a tendency to go 
after higher prices and fewer transactions. And this is another tendential, I think, element of the contemporary art market that uh, this sort of right tail, what in economics is called right tail um, tendency, where actors prefer to have higher kind of single transactions, higher but fewer of these transactions, than more but smaller players. And this ultimately affects the entire ecology. It means that there can only be fewer successful artists, or that basically means that the entire kind of market is bifurcated in two parts. You know, there, there's this sort of tiny sliver, whatever tiny percentage of the market who are super successful, and then the rest of the market that is just about trying to get by. Um, and of course, this is also a perfect representation of life under contemporary capitalism. So I think here there's quite a nice uh, reflective sort of synchronicity. Um, and so the second characteristic, stark informational asymmetries, really feeds in and informs um, the previous conditions, the lack of transparency conditions, uh, because it is ultimately the stark informational asymmetries which allow for this kind of bifurcation to exist. And ultimately, the kind of the symptom uh, of this state of affairs is illiquidity, i.e., well, illiquidity, I guess we all know about that if we work in this field. Um, but what I think is quite interesting to turn to in terms of how all of this is possible, like how is it possible that we have such an oligopolistically inclined market or effectively a cartel formation market? Um, and why are such practices like insider trading even tolerated? Um, and it goes really down, I, th I think, fundamentally to this notion of exceptionality of art. So the exceptionality of art, and it has a kind of philosophical backbone history which is uh, manifested through this modernist notion of autonomous art um, and the fact that the artist is somehow separate and autonomous from the rest of society, you know, this really kind of Kantian, Heideggerian understanding of art as something that shouldn't be instrumentalized, shouldn't be part of the, you know, productive economy or whatever, the real economy, but should be considered something outside of it. Um, and of course, this kind of exceptionality argument, the way that it plays out on a practical level, it creates a very highly protected market into which the barriers to entry to this market are, yeah, super high. Um, but I think it also does a couple of other things which I would sort of like to point out. Um, it makes it possible, for example, this is also quite a weird condition on the surface, for museums, artistic practices, curatorial practices to make really progressive claims, you know, to be very critical, to be kind of commenting about all the terrible things that are going on financially, economically, socially, politically, yet at the same time, uh, to exist within a practical infrastructural system that is anything but fair, and you know, and that is manifested um, kind of in, in sort of very kind of banal examples of um, corporate sponsorship uh, that supports uh, artistic practices, which are all about celebrating the local, the small, you know, smelling the flower, that kind of thing. You know, that kind of. Um, sort of almost like absurdist uh, contrast between it and someone like Deutsche Bank supporting that kind of practice for me is always um, yeah, quite telling about what this exceptionality argument allows. But this is really banal, um, as is, for example, the fact that certain progressive art institutions hardly ever pay their artists because, you know, artists are supposed to survive on air um, because they're autonomous. Um, so, you know, this is silly stuff, really, but I think it's, but it's systematic, right? That's, that's the way, that's the way the field works. Um, but not to say that the way this kind of paradigm works is any different from the way any other sector in, you know, modern capitalist economy works. Perfect example is um, the branding, kind of the progressive branding that's associated with something like the sharing economy. So the sharing economy is supposed to give us access to assets at a lower price and therefore, well, basically give access to people who wouldn't have access to certain services and products, uh, travel, etc. Um, and to make our lives nicer. Um, but that's the sort of surface layer of branding at the kind of infrastructural basis of it. Uh, sharing economy kind of it, example being Uber, or Airbnb, you know, the big kind of Silicon Valley. Um, tech startup uh, or sharing economy examples, they basically restructure the supply side of the equation. 
So they feed on the precarity of certain workers in, in cities where people need to earn extra income, but they take out, let's say, the labor unions, the companies that would be somehow responsible for these workers, the pension schemes and all the rest of it. Um, this is all to say just that the, this kind of exceptionality of art in terms of art not living up infrastructure, its progressive claims, is not unique to the art field, the contemporary art field. I think it's actually something that's quite pervasive. And this is something that's recognized by the contemporary art field. And you know, we have numerous essays, shows, curatorial statements, artistic words associated with the melancholia about this kind of, oh, you know, how, what do we do about this disempowering condition? Um, and you know, I, I kind of think that we actually can do quite a lot with manipulatively and strategically with this sort of understanding that art positions its own exceptionality only to ever betray it. And um, the way that I'd like to think about the possibility of capitalizing on this approach is through thinking um, work within the contemporary art field, whether you're an artist or curator or a smaller institution or whatever, as a means of prototyping. And why prototyping? So I think what's interesting about the contemporary art field and the contemporary art specifically, not you know its sort of historical um, its historical precedents, is that contemporary art is not actually committed to any discipline. So it kind of uh, it derives knowledge or it derives information or whatever from other fields. It kind of synthesizes it in one way or another, um, mostly in very trivial ways. Um, and it's sort of only just committed kind of to itself. But this transdisciplinarity, I think, also allows, a transdisciplinarity but also non-commitment to other fields, allows for interesting new models to emerge. And the, the bigger question for me is just, you know, you can have models that are just comments, like commentary on what's going on, which is what contemporary art does now, or you have models that are prototypes. And, you know, and prototypes have a very specific function to actually change something systemically. Um, and the kind of prototypes that I'm interested in are the prototypes that ultimately um, allow for different economic models to emerge. Um, and I think if you allow for kind of different economic models to emerge, even at the level of, kind of speculative scenario within the contemporary art field, you can start doing something with it. I mean, how far you can go with it is another question, but a very big one, um, and one that I won't be able to answer. Uh, or maybe I will sometime, sometime when the prototyping process um, goes a bit further. Um, but I think it's also important to remember the historical precedence of thinking through prototyping from within the field of art. Um, and to me, sort of a big inspiration in that regard is Seth Sigalow, who was sort of a curator and generally you know, a huge personality uh, in New York art scene, emerging conceptual art scene in the 70s. And uh, um, the fact that that man, Sassiglaub, has sort of worn a multiplicity of hats, so he worked as, you know, he was a curator, but sometimes he was also seen as an artist. He was an ideologue, but he was also really interested in uh, producing market models. So he understood in the 70s that the contemporary art, what, what's going to become contemporary art, market is going to become, is going to be big, or at least it's going to be something that is slightly different and new to what already exists. Um, and so together with a lawyer, um, he put together uh, a contract, sort of a prototype of a contract called the Artists' Reserve Rights Transfer and Sale Agreement, um, which basically gave um, artists a right to um, 50% of profit of future resale of their work. So basically the model that we have now is you, know, you have an artist, you have a gallery or no gallery, you have a collector who buys. That's, so that's done. And then the artist is out of the equation. Um, and, and that's a deeply unfair economic model because, uh, well, I, I don't think I need to explain why that's a deeply unfair economic model. But um, ultimately, what Satsikolo tried to do is he tried to integrate the artist and all the consequent resales of the work, meaning that um, every time that work would be resold, the artist would get 50%, uh, 15% of the profit. 15, one five, yeah. yeah. 
50% of the profit. There are other, I mean, and that was just the financial aspect of it. But in general, I mean, there are other characteristics. I'm so sorry the print is so bad and I can't even read it myself now. Um, but there are other sort of terms that uh, he put in there which relate to the way that the work would be shown. So basically just the way it would be uh, treated or prepared in case it broke. It's kind of giving a sort of um, uh, projected agency that isn't attached to ownership, but is attached ultimately to copyright in a way, uh, but that extends over time. But the, excuse me, but yeah. so it happens also in the secondary market, then how basically exactly. can secure it for the uh, Well, this is the whole thing. So, so this was, a pro as I said, it was a prototype. So the idea was that um, this would happen, that the secondary market, I think the idea was that the secondary market would be something different to what we know it now. Because right now we have, you know, we have a very uh, suffocated market, right? So we have the primary market, we have dealers who can kind of negotiate resale after primary market, and we have the auction house network to which there's very little access unless you're a super privileged player, right? Um, I think this model, it's, uh, it hoped for a much more dynamic and open secondary market. Um, and I guess this is the biggest problem, I, I would say this is the biggest problem of illiquidity, like the consequence, as I say, specters of illiquidity, because, yeah, the biggest problem currently is that the secondary market, well, the, the primary market is so tightly controlled by, uh, like, gallery cartels, the secondary market is so tightly controlled by, once again, close-knit networks of dealers and auction houses, um, that, yeah, there is very little space to maneuver or change something in that regard. Um, one of Seth Siegelab's contemporaries was a curator named Jack Burnham, and he came up with this notion of systems aesthetics, and um, in 1968 he wrote an article about it in Art Forum, and basically what he promoted there was this understanding that with the coming of a cybernetic age, we need to start thinking about um, art not in terms of objects or kind of sort of yeah object bound um, representations, but in terms of the kind of systems that are put into place. So of course this was very heavily influenced by systems theory and informational theory and the understanding that you know you can have um, uh, that basically you can produce um, scalable outputs by um, kind of by basically inserting a certain algorithm into a computational environment. So it's this idea that it's not just about static objects, it's about the relationships that are produced between entities. And uh, of course this kind of uh, very network theory based understanding of what art can be and should be was rooted within the conceptual art movement. But it's also quite interesting that you know Seth Siegelau's contract did not get taken up by the market, so it never got taken seriously. Uh, I think because at that stage the market was too small and it, that, that was just too, it was too socialist of an idea to even implement that. Uh, but simultaneously the conceptual art, which kind of had the possibility of dispersing this object form into informational flows, it ultimately got locked down within object forms that were easily sold on the market. Um, and this difference that I'm kind of pointing to between what Keller Easterling calls object form and active form, um, I think it's quite crucial when we think about the prototyping that I'd like to suggest. So here we've got sort of a set of identical, um, basically just, as I say, this kind of algorithmic production of housing. It's a suburban neighborhood somewhere in China. And, and we realize that you know, most of the planet is getting filled up in terms of the urban environment in this manner. It's not about kind of producing bespoke, but even like the bespoke uh, architectural statements by architects, they're still sort of generated through a reproducible like, algorithmic uh, logic. But here it's much more, um, it's much more visible. It's kind of uh, that it's not really about producing objects. It's about producing informational constellations that easily replicate across systems. And so this kind of uh, idea that within the kind of economic and also kind of cybernetic age that we um, inhabit, 
this production of um, informational constellations that can be systemically reproduced um, is what is required. Um, so that was kind of, this is just all of this information was a, a background story to um, kind of prototype and project that I was involved in. Um, together with a few couple other people, including Christopher Calendron Thomas, who's unfortunately not here, mm -hmm. Diane Bauer and uh, Suhail Malik. Um, and yeah, this show was a show slash project was supported by um, a really nice gallerist in New York called Prem uh, at K Gallery in, yeah, in, in, in downtown New York. But anyhow, um, the real f so the project was called Real Flow and it was an attempt to think uh, a prototype to produce a prototype for a more distributed kind of economic system within the contemporary art ecology. So um, I, w I think I will just first show you the sort of promotional fluffy video, um, and then I will talk you through the project. So supposing this is going to work. Oh no, it's not going to work. One second. Um, that's not good. Okay. Sorry, I, I didn't foresee the technical issues. Well, I think the conclusion is that it's not going to work. But, um, okay, so, <laughs> but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> if you're really interested, I, I can give you the details after the talk. Whoa, so here's a message from, no, from my collaborators. Anyhow, um, sorry about you can't see that, interesting. Um, okay, so, Basically, Real Flow was a project where we tried to produce this kind of alternative, diversified ways of thinking about um, liquidity in, in the art field. Uh, what the project was, so we kind of produced four um, zombie formalist paintings, and at that time when this was done, um, it was 2015, yeah, it was a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, hype around zombie formalism and flipping, um, uh, this kind of the practice of sort of um, purchasing artworks, quickly reselling them for profit and orchestrating a number of resales in order to obviously, yeah, to generate, um, to, to, to generate the value for an artwork in a very kind of speedy, accelerated manner. So, um, I, I mean, I, the idea to actually, to do, to use these um, as a reference point was Christopher, so can't take credit for that. So basically, but these paintings, they kind of functioned as um, a backdrop to the project. So the project was actually focused on an investment portfolio, which offered for sale a series of um, financial instruments. Um, the first, so there were kind of three financial instruments, so to speak. So the first financial instrument, um, which had a long number, but let's call it X. Um, it was basically the separation of the physical aspect of the artwork, right? The physical manifestation of it from the ownership claim, you know, from the certificate of ownership. So um, the idea was that we could lend these objects um, to institutions, to private collectors, to whoever, um, as long as they covered all the overhead costs of uh, the of exhibiting and um, gave us a 20% fee of, uh, sorry, 20% uh, of the exhibition, the fee equal 20% of the exhibition costs. So this was to account for the fact that different institutions would kind of have different, um, different possibilities in terms of, you know, what, what they could afford. Um, so that was just kind of the separate life, the ghostly life of the object, right, of the artwork. Then the certificate of ownership was the second instrument that you could purchase. And basically you purchase the certificate of ownership without um, the stress of having the physical object. So you don't need to store it, you don't need to take care of it. If you're just literally interested in um, basically in, kind of in reselling it uh, and speculating kind of on its value increase, that's what you do. And what I mean, the way that we kind of framed it is that ultimately it's just a certificate of ownership and you take out 
all this sort of fluff for art fluff, um, you, you increase the liquidity of the market, you increase it, you lubricate it effectively. Um, then the third dimension, which was kind of the more difficult dimension to think through and also eventually, if this were to go forward, to implement, um, was to produce contracts that would effectively be financial derivative contracts. So a derivative contract um, is it's, it's just a contract that based, the value of which um, is set to depend on the frequency of change either in price or other um, criteria of the underlying. So there's the underlying, which is the painting, or which is the certificate of ownership. It's that the value of that underlying will shift over time. Then there's the financial contract, uh, the derivative contract, which um, as, as its value generation mechanism, it refers to the value fluctuations within the certificate of ownership, and as a result, you create a financial market. So it's a form of like formal financialization. Obviously, it depends. Um, it, it relies on the existence of multiplicity of actors being interested in trade and these kind of instruments. Uh, but for us, it was also a way of showing that actually you can already now basically create a financial market for. Uh, contemporary art. So, because a lot of people are saying, well, because it's illiquid, lack of transparency, etc., it's very difficult. But I, I don't think that's the case. I think the reason it's not becoming financialized has much more to do with the protectionism of the primary and secondary market actors than anything else. Um, and so, so this initial kind of prototype um, was really a means for us to think, uh, do a couple of things. I mean, for me, it was a way of kind of de deconstructing where value generation actually happens. And you realize that there are kind of two important moments of value generation in contemporary art. The first moment is where does this work get shown? Who owns it? Who shows it? You know? So it's this kind of, this, this, uh, coming back to this reputational economy point. Um, so that's one avenue of, um, of value generation it becomes really blatant when you separate the object from the certificate of ownership. Then the second point of value generation is, of course, uh, the speculative moment. And it's the speculative moment is just literally the shift in prices as a certain work gets exchanged, as a certain certificate of ownership gets exchanged on the market, while at the same time there is museum activity and exhibitionary activity happening elsewhere. Um, so that was a really neat way of laying that out because you know right now on the one hand we want to say that the art market is separate on the other hand it's not separate at all because of all the kind of interpersonal connections between curators and you know artists uh, uh, financiers whatever so uh, yeah this was a very useful exercise in that regard um, it was also useful in understanding what it doesn't achieve and I think what it doesn't achieve um, is um, eradication of, I think, one of the biggest problems of the contemporary art market, which is insider trading, effectively insider trading. Because um, ultimately, you can still have the owners of certificates of ownership collude with the museums and the galleries and whatever the showing venues in order to generate um, revenue for the works. Um, so this was just a quick outline of uh, yeah, of, of a sort of prototyping project that I was involved in. Um, and I, I think where it took me now is understanding that actually in order to make uh, that kind of project effective, um, you kind of, you, you also need to insert it into an informational field where it can be taken up on a systemic level. So if it, if it just exists as sort of an artistic statement of sorts, right, it doesn't actually go that far beyond the current model that we have of art ref like reflecting on commenting on the state of affairs. Um, so it's really about devising the technologies through which um, that kind of project can self-position itself as something worth taking up. And, you know, that, that is an open question. That's a technology I'd like to devise. I mean, this last slide, which is a little bit... Um, a little bit, yeah, um, maybe over the top, but this is um, an intergalactic water reservoir, uh, and right, and so like it's it's a really interesting thing because we realize that whatever the, our resources on planet Earth are finite, you know, we'll all probably die, you know be extinct in a couple of hundred years, 
But you know, all of a sudden we realize that oh, but there is a source of liquid, literal liquidity elsewhere. But the problem is how do we actually get there? Technology. And then the question, the second question, which I think is even more important than the technology, is the question of how do we organize the distribution channels for liquidity so that it just doesn't come back to basically what we have, which is not satisfactory. I think I'll stop here, and Naringa, I'm sure you have some very pressing questions. Pressing questions. I have a few questions. One is regarding the autonomy of art. And uh, in a way, you kind of reinforce the autonomy of art um, and kind of reverse the, the whole project of almost the whole 20th century um, art uh, horizon is to merge art and life in, in a sense, to kind of uh, disintegrate the autonomy of art. And uh, what you do, you kind of, you go the opposite way, which I find quite interesting. And um, uh, I think uh, your project uh, is a good example of how using autonomy of art as this kind of autonomous field, you can propose uh, alter alternate ways of being and alternate ways of economic, economic models in real flow case. But also, um, for example, we know the example of the wage, mm -hmm. uh, which is wage is uh, a group of uh, artists and activists in New York, and uh, wage stands for working artists in greater economy. And basically what they do is um, they made a survey of uh, what, how much artists uh, get for uh, a performance, a solo show, a group participation, show, yeah. participation in different institutions and that they found out the artists get really little. And so what they made is... Especially in comparison to what the highest salary is within that institution. I mean that's quite particular to the US context, but yeah. yeah. But uh, the idea is that uh, they proposed a kind of uh, a calculator uh, according to the budget of the institution and how much it should give an artist every time the artist has a show or, or a performance. And that started working in real life uh, because um, it started working through shaming, basically. Uh, because institutions started to, to be ashamed of not paying any fee for an artist. And yeah, it became damaging to them in terms of reputation. So quality. this is... This is kind of returning to my question yeah. about how would you think your project could be implemented in real life and how do you think this reputational economy might help or not help in this case and how vast this implementation could could be actually? Well, I actually think it, it would require something similar which is a sort of a much more network kind of based um, lobby effectively. It would, it would cre require creation of a lobby in order for those effects to be uh, tangible and to become systematic. Because in the case of wage, I mean, the, it was very smart because the artists who are involved there are quite respected. So there's, there's already this kind of aspect of uh, um, reputational economy. So, you know, you can't just not really care about what they think. Um, and similarly, they, but they also put into place a mechanism, which is the accreditation system. So once institutions uh, start kind of paying according to what the calculations show, they get accredited by wage and that gets sort of a promotional moment, like newsletters sent out, visibility, you get a stamp, et cetera, et cetera. So I think some kind of, it's, it's, and it's the sort of, um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the Russian expression, where you have a whip and, um, and it's a biscuit. So it's this kind of understanding that you know, you need to kind of whip the system through the reputational economy and give it some sort of a biscuit. So I guess, yes, that's that's what would be required. But equally, that project needs to be proposed and um, inserted and made and put on the agenda by a sufficiently weighty actor, of which there need to be a few. Yeah, I, what I didn't really uh, get in real flow specific kind of contract of... Um, the ownership thing. Do you, does artists still get some percentage from that? Like in yeah, Zimbabwe it's more case? about resale. So the the kind of the re, the um, the artist. So whereas in the in Sikalov's contract, the uh, percentage, the fifteen percent, comes out of um, the equity model, 
right? So it's where the actual work is resold, etc. Uh, in our case, because you know we really want to forefront this financialization angle, it comes out of the financial market circulation. So it's actually in reselling the, fin the financial instrument that circulates within the financial market that the artist then gets, um, I already forgot how much did I say, what 20%? No, it was much less than that. And yeah, it was something, but it was, I mean, the, f the numbers here are really just nominal because we, we don't really have any reference points. But yeah. Okay, um, maybe the last questions and then we can open up to the audience because we don't have much time. Yeah. Um, but we're, all, we're much more in time than the last people, so yes. congratulations <laughs> to us. Accelerated. <laughs> we're accelerated. Um, maybe the last question would be also a problematic one. How do you prevent the insider trading in the case of real flow? You mentioned a startup uh, that wants to do chips yeah. and works, which is an interesting case also. I mean, yeah, so this is interesting because um, the question of enforcement has always been a very uh, problematic one in the contemporary art field because ultimately you can't know if there's if there's lack of transparency at the level of transaction and works artworks change hands all the time or not all the time actually they don't change hands all the time but they can change hands a number of times there's no way of tracking tracing that work um, and this is particularly problematic I think within the sort of um, impressionist. Uh, um, the resell impressionist artwork, so this is not really contemporary art, but this is where the big bucks are, the like resell impressionist works. And of, of course this has generated um, a lot of fake works being produced. So I think there's an idea for a startup where basically chips uh, that would trace the kind of uh, the, the, the location of a works would be inserted into authentic works and there in this way their kind of uh, physical location could be traced. But I think in the case of real flow and insider trading, we're not really talking about this kind of physical change of hands and needing to trace that. That's, it's important, but not as important as the larger question of how do you control that the owner of the certificate doesn't basically, uh, well, doesn't agree on a mid-career retrospective at MoMA with whatever, with whoever, right? So um, that's a question of regulation, right? Because you can't, I mean, you could rely, and regulation is a question of state control. So, and I think we're actually not that far away from some form of regulation, especially on that level being implemented within some jurisdictions. Um, you know, I think this, this whole thing that Hito Style has taken up um, in terms of, um, kind of the way that art kind of crosses boundaries and the way it's used as a sort of, uh, uh, as, as a basically, um, God, you, you said it before, um, as a way of laundering money, etc. You know, the kind of revelations of the Panama Papers uh, about the function of artworks within like, the process of storing value or storing liquidity that wasn't uh, gained in legal ways, etc. Mm -hmm. the, these questions are, are here and they, they are becoming ever more prominent the more the prices for artworks kind of skyrocket at the top end of the market. So I think there will be some sort of regulation, but um, until then, there is no solution for insider trading. <laughs> Sad about that, but uh, it's an interesting point where uh, autonomy of art is uh, meets the the outside world, where regulation would kind of interfere in this autonomy yeah. field. Which we'll see about that. I don't know if there, yeah, there, please. Um, yeah, so, so with real flow, I understand the like the usage model. So someone wants to show the piece and that's yeah. their paper. And um, the, 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 say the physical certificate of ownership, um, I understand that part. And I'm just thinking that, so, that there's one startup in New York and in London, both work on a blockchain solution. Yeah, totally. Um, but I don't understand the derivative. So well, how, how would the derivative be priced? Well, the, the, but this will ch the thing is, this will change with uh, the production of the market because ultimately you need to have sufficient number of players within the financial market to actually, for the derivative contract to start being evaluated against other, um, against other contracts within that market. Effectively, what ha has happened with financialization, right? So if initially financialization was a way for, um, uh, for, kind of for companies 
like hedging on risk or but ultimately you know when like in the 80s for example with the Reagan um, uh, decision well with the decision to kind of detach the delivery of the underlying um, when a certain contract is exchanged certain financial contract these two aspects got completely separated so they kind of not completely, but separate in terms of valuation. So basically, valuation would then uh, depend on the movements of other contracts within that particular market ecology. So the, this sort of um, the derivative model, it's I think I think it's the most tenuous and problematic one because it relies on uh, the existence of at least two actors that are interested in producing this market. So it probably needs some, some dynamics to happen first. Exactly. But what could be stripped out as a derivative. Absolutely. Abs but I, I mean, if, I, I don't know, I couldn't, <laughs> this is my speculation, but I believe that um, there are already certain kind of banks um, and financial players that are that have thought about this. I think the problem once again comes to what Vedhus points out, which is the art market is just too unstable and volatile and too dependent on its very particular reputational economy for big players like financial actors to move into it. So in a sense, like I think what we're doing from our kind of uh, whatever artistic, theoretical, philosophical slash Social grassroots, <laughs> you know, pseudo-socialist way, I, I I think all of these models already exist. It's just they have not been implemented um, because the time has not come. So the question for me is also who does the financialization? Because it will happen. But on, you know, and who does it will also dictate on what terms it happens and in which way the liquidity, as I said, the liquidity channels are structured. So yeah, I hope that's a bit clearer. Everyone is preparing to read the 4,000 word <laughs> article that you prepared for Art News. And, um, <laughs> thanks a lot, Victoria, yeah. for coming and giving this amazing talk. And yeah, thank you for, for listening so patiently. <laughs>